has disappeared It's just a vapor now I have been made whole My heart is so full My cup overflows What once was so fractured Has been restored Welcome to church, you hearty Michiganders, you. And welcome those of you who are watching our service online. Take a minute if you're watching online or if you're surfing while you're in the service to share the link with somebody who might not be here. Someone once wisely said this, what we do, we do what we do because we want what we want. Did you catch, did you catch that? Someone wisely once said, we do what we do because we want what we want. We all have wants. We all have powerful longings. We've, we've talked about this before. We'll, we'll talk about it again. Some of us, we, when we long, we look back. Maybe these are nostalgic types or conservative types. Like, for instance, I have a cup from Mitford, North Carolina, but the place doesn't really exist. The lady made it up in a book. And I'd love to go there, but you really can't. I have another cup from the Chatterbox Cafe in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota. But Lake Wobegon, Minnesota only exists in our nostalgic mind. Some people with their longings, they, they look back to, to Mayberry or to the little house on the prairie or things in the past. It used to be things were better than they are now. Some of us in our longings look forward. These would be progressives. We like sci-fi. People like that like sci-fi or like, I was thinking about this. If, you knew me when I was 14 years old. You might have found me after school laying on the floor with headphones on within reach of our huge stereo, which back then was like about the size of a garage, <laughs> listening to John Denver. He had a beautiful song. You know it. Um, he said in the song, here are the lyrics. I was born in the summer of my 27th year. Can anybody, can anybody finish that? That's right, be going home to a place I'd never been before. Going home to a place, and he goes on, Let, he left yesterday behind him. You might say he's, yeah, born again. B, we must be the same age. <laughs> what, what, what about that? Well, certainly not. You're younger than I am. But some of us said, look forward. That's what he did. That's what John Denver, when he wrote that beautiful lyric, he was looking forward. He was thinking, well, maybe my greatest longings will be met in, a, in another state in a state with mountains in a beautiful place like that we all have longings and some of us we look back with our longings and some of us we look forward with our longings and most of us look around with our longings maybe there's a person that will fulfill my deepest longings maybe there's a place i can go where I'll be fulfilled. Maybe there's a possession I can own. Maybe there's an experience I can have. Maybe there's a destination I can travel to where I'll be fulfilled. We all have powerful longings and we, we, we do what we do because we, we want what we want. Maybe some of us are thinking, we're, I mean, we're still, how many of you are still keeping your New Year's resolution and you think maybe this year you will achieve maximum fitness? Yeah, you won't, but you know, we think that. Or, or, or some of us think, well, maybe if we just change jobs, or maybe our thoughts are darker, maybe I married the wrong person, maybe I even followed the wrong God. Or maybe it's just simpler, maybe it's just if I lived in a place where there was less ice and more sunshine, then <laughs> I could be happy. You read about Camelot. Of course you know about that, this idyllic kingdom that never was. It, 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 when John F. Kennedy was elected president, his wife Jackie was a beautiful young woman, 31 years old. He was 43, she was 31. He was handsome, he was wealthy, he was popular. And when they occupied the, uh, the, the White House, 
They occupied the White House as a young, privileged, powerful, beautiful couple with a perfect family, one girl and one boy. And people said it's like the American Camelot. Some of you remember this. Some of you have just read about it. But you know this. In 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. And in that year, Life magazine came and did an interview with his wife, Jacqueline. And she referenced a musical built after the idea of Camelot. She, she referenced a line that was one of her fa- husband's favorite lines. It was used to describe their brief time in the White House. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. Do any of you remember that? But all of us have that in our soul. And, and, and she said, there will be great presidents again, but there will never be another Camelot. It will never be that way again. But older than the ancient legends of King Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot and the Round Table, older than all of that is, is a garden called Eden, is a garden paradise of God. And the longing goes back even farther than that, into the very mind, into the heart of the one who made each one of our minds and hearts. We, we, we have longings. And our longings are designed to draw us to God and, into the, and to introduce us to the ultimate king and to the ultimate kingdom. According to the Bible, our longing for Camelot, our longing for a, a to go home to a place we've never been before it's a longing for a king it's a longing for a kingdom it's built in us to long for god and this is the thing and and, and if you read in in throughout you know the western literature mostly christian literature you see this over and over again that others have seen this all of our lesser longings are designed to draw us to god and into his kingdom there's this famous quote you know it by c.s lewis if we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world you've heard that english romantic poet william wordsworth called these kinds of yearnings intimations of immortality like hints that there's more right and the theologian paul tillich called the spiritual beauty inherent in good art he called it messengers from another world And there is something when you look at a mountainscape or a good piece of art or you listen to a piece of music or you you watch a compelling movie or you read a compelling story that pulls you into another world and hints that there's something more. And this something more was designed to draw us to God. Augustine wrote, our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. And then all throughout the Bible, you see the truth of this peppered throughout the Bible. Solomon hints in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has put eternity into every one of our hearts. David said, you've made known to us the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are blessings that last forever, forevermore. Paul wrote, right now we see, but we see in a mirror darkly, dimly. We get a hint, but we don't see the full thing. And God placed this message of the kingdom and the king and the, you know, the locus of all of our longings. He placed that message into the mouth of his prophets. And he placed that message into the mouth of his apostles. And he wrote that message in the Bible for all of us, none of us to miss it. Paul, uh, Peter called it in, in a message in Acts chapter 3, a time of the restoration of all things. And he was remembering what Jesus taught him. J- Peter, Peter had asked Jesus what... What we have, we've left everything to follow you. What will we have? And Jesus said, truly I say to you, in the new world or in the regeneration, there's something that you long for that you're looking forward to. And so these longings were made to draw us into an ultimate king, an ultimate kingdom. And and when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom and he told us how to enter it. And this is really, really fascinating. How did Jesus say to enter the kingdom? That good news is, Jesus came with a promised kingdom, and we were made for this kingdom. We were created to live with this king forever. And one day, the kingdom of God, the Bible says, will conquer all the kingdoms of the earth and all the kingdoms of our heart and all the false kingdoms and all the plastic kingdoms and all the temporary kingdoms will be, it will be eaten up. And, and the Bible says at that time, all things will be restored. This is the great hope that beats in a Christian's heart. 
And Jesus himself said this, and if you look in Mark, if you look in Matthew, see it very plainly. But in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, Jesus gave the key to getting, he said the kingdom is here, and here's the key to getting into it. Key to the fulfillment of all the longings that you ever looked back to or looked forward to or looked around for is what you might not think. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did he say? Repent. Repent. This is how you get in the kingdom. You repent into the kingdom. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when you repent, and then when you start living with kingdom principles beating in your heart, and then when you look forward to the ultimate kingdom of Christ, when that is your highest value and your greatest desire and your singular aim, then at that time, Jesus says, we're moving toward what he called the restoration of all things. And that's the same message that Joel gave to the southern kingdom, to Judah, that we've been studying in this series of messages that we're calling Restored Better Than New. And we're talking about how can we be restored better than new? And how how can we help others to be restored better than new? And we studied the first couple of chapters last week, and and we, we really gave a message that had two simple points. And they were the same things that Jesus said. When you see that you're surrounded by things that aren't pleasing to God or, or sin, you lament, you grieve, you see it the way God sees it. And when you participate in that sin, you lament and you repent. All, all of you, inside and out, turns away from that and to God. This is really a message about an idolatry to Judah it, about who God really is and where they should locate their longings. So when others around us sin, what should we do? We should lament. We should grieve. And when we participate in that sin, we should lament and we should repent. And then what Joel says and what Jesus said and what every prophet said is that when we look at sin the way God wants us to look at sin and we grieve over it, This would be true in our own life. This would be true in our church. This would be true in our marriages and our families. When we see sin the way God sees it and we grieve over it, and when we participate in sin, we repent of it, then he's always promised that he will will bring a renewal. He will bring refreshment. He will will act on our behalf. And that's where we arrive at Joel chapter 2 and verses 17. Uh, Today, this section from verses 17... Uh, through 27 that's what we'll we'll see today how do we know though that we have a right to claim the promises that are made in this text to judah how we know that because that's what we're going to do we're going to cherry pick these promises for ourselves we want to make sure that they are they can be legitimately applied to us and how do we know that well we know a couple we know for a couple of reasons one reason that we know that when we read these promises that God says to Judah through Joel, when you repent, this is what I'm going to do. When you lament, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you blessing. I'm going to show you favor. I'm going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. One of the reasons that we know that is because the same promises in the same language are repeated to us in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, what you're going to see is something even sweeter than that. And you'll see it in the next section that we, we arrive at next week that this is specifically fulfilled at Pentecost. It becomes, it begins to be fulfilled at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, recorded in Acts chapter 2, for the church, for us, for the church age. In other words, the promises that we're going to talk about aren't just for ancient Israel or ancient Judah. They're literally for you and for me, for our children today. They, the things we're talking about, we can, we can, they're for us. We can enter into them. In Malachi, one of the prophets Malachi 3, 7 says, he says, return to me, and I will return to you. In Zechariah 1, 3, he says, return to, God says through the prophet, if you return to me, I'll return to you. In Joel, God says through the prophet Joel, if you return to me, I will return to you. In James, in the New Testament, it says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. 
in the other church I pastored before here, one of the church secretaries said to me one day, she said, Pastor, pray for me this weekend. I'm going away for a retreat. I'm just praying that I'll be able to meet with God. And I said, I promise you will. And she said, how do you know? I said, because he promised he would. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. It, when, you, when your preparation on Saturday night for the Lord's Day, and you're driving to church, and your disposition about how you get ready for church, if you're drawing near to God, he's promised to draw near to you. If you're going away for a retreat, and the purpose is to seek God and to get to know him, he's promised if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. If you feel far away from God, move closer to him, and he will move closer to you. This is what Joel is saying, but he says it in a gorgeous and poetic way, and we're going to study that now from verse 19, verse 18 through 27. I'm going to read that with some commentary. Think about this as a message that you're hearing if you're in the nation of Judah, and you've had all kinds of difficulty and hardship, this locust infestation, and then these, these enemies poised at your northern border about to sweep in and make things a lot worse. This is the promise then that comes in verse 18. But then the Lord became jealous or zealous for his land, and he had pity on his people. This assumes they did lament and they did repent. The Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I'm sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you'll be satisfied. He promises them that he will satisfy them. And he says this, and it's a theme that pops up about four times in this brief passage. He says, I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. Things are going to change. Folks, God was saying to Judah through Joel, if you repent, I will act on your behalf and you will be satisfied. And he says, and you'll be protected. Verse 20, I'll remove the northerner far from you, drive him into a parched and desolate land. His vanguard, that would be his, the, the thing that leads, will be into the eastern sea his rear guard into the western sea the stench and foul smell of him will rise for he has done great things or terrible things against you god says to judah you repent and i will fight your enemies he says to judah if you repent and if you lament and if you see sin the way i see sin then i will bring you great satisfaction i will lift your shame and i will fight against your enemies and verse 27 fear not O land be glad and rejoice for the lord has done great things Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, and the tree bears its fruit, and the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. This is, um, a, a, again, a promise that he's going to restore their gladness. He's going to restore their joy. He's going to restore their song. He's going to restore their worship. And then in verse 23, be glad, children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord. He has given the early rain for your vindication. And there's that theme again. And he's poured down for you abundant rain and the early and the latter rain as before. And this is this early and latter rain in the ancient Near East, in the Middle East even today, is seen as the favor of the Lord. And he's saying, what, what, what is it that will bring this favor? When they lament and when they repent. This is what the prophets continually say. And this is what Jesus came saying. If you're looking at one of the great secrets of the world, this is it. God says, I pour out blessing on people who are grieved about the sin around them and repentant and grieved about their own sin. This is a powerful thing. You want blessing of God on your marriage? You want blessing of God on your life? You want blessing of God on your work? You want the blessing of God in your school? You want the blessing of God in your parenting? You want the blessing of God wherever you, you it, then, then this is what God always blesses, a tenderness of heart about sin, a lamentation and repentance. And then, and then he says uh, this beautiful uh, phrase in verse 25, upon which we've kind of built the sermon idea, I will restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, destroyer, the cutter, the great army which I sent among you. I'll restore the years... <laughs> The swarming locust is eaten. God's promised that when Judah repents, he will make up for the judgment that they had in a miraculous way, and he will restore everything. You will eat, verse 26, in plenty. You will be satisfied, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has 
dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. The third time it's been repeated, and again, in the last verse of this section, he'll repeat that again. You will know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And this is the clearest hint in Joel about what was the major sin of Judah that they need to repent of, and it was that they were seeing that they were locating their desires in other gods, which we don't want to be too quick to judge them, because that's probably the most likely thing that we do is to look to somebody or something else for what only God can give, or give somebody or something else what belongs to God. He says, when that happens in your heart, you're drifting, grieve over that and repent. Honestly admit your sin. And then he says, I'm going to pour out blessing. He says, and you will know that I'm in the midst of Israel. Verse 27, you will know that I'm in the midst. You will know that I'm in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God and there is none else. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Let's apply these things to us as the Lord would have us do. What happens when we recognize that the kingdom of god is coming and it's kind of an already not yet thing right you've heard it referred to that way the kingdom god says jesus comes and he says the kingdom of god is here repent into it but the millennial reign hasn't come yet right the one thousand year reign of christ isn't happening right now the ultimate and eternal kingdom of god isn't happening right now the bible's clear that's going to be future but it has started in a spiritual sense because all throughout the book of acts and the historic record of the early church, it talks about that all the time. It uses kingdom language from the beginning of Acts to the end of Acts. If you study the book of Acts and you look for kingdom, you'll find from the very beginning all the way through to the very last, I think probably the last verse or two of Acts, he's appealing to this loyalty to the king, this kingdom that we're locating our longings in. What I'm saying to you is that the message God gave through Joel to Judah, he gives through Jesus and the Holy Spirit to you and to me today. The same thing that he did for them, he will do for us. He will, in other words, when we turn away and when we keep turning away from our locating our longings and desires and things that are lesser, and we see them as things that were to stimulate our appetite for him, then he will pour blessing and continual blessing into our lives. This is a powerful thing. Let's look at them one at a time. First, he will restore our satisfaction. He'll restore our longings. And no satisfaction is seeking a false God. But seeking in Jesus, they, he restores satisfaction. That's why he said to them in verse 19, Behold, I'm sending you grain and wine and oil. You will be satisfied. Jesus used similar language when he offered his kingdom uh, to his people. And you see that throughout scripture. The second thing in verse 20, he will also, not only will he restore a sense of satisfaction to us, he'll restore our peace. And most people, lots of people today, they're struggling with uh, anxiety, a lack of inner peace, a sense of impending doom, fear, something bad is going to happen, someone is going to hurt me. In a kingdom way, when we turn to Christ, he becomes our king, and progressively, as we yield ourselves to him, we should be experiencing more and more less anxiety and more peace because the king reigns in our heart. There was a shooting in a church in Texas two weeks ago. You might have seen the video of the shooting. They were having communion. And the African-American brother was in the back corner of the church, and he was administering communion, a man that had been walking with the Lord and had gone to that church his entire life, a faithful, godly man, worked in the medical field. And he was giving communion to the young man who shot him dead. And, and humanly, that just seems like such a violent tragedy. And humanly, of course, it is. And yet when you think about that, he lingered for just a little while and probably died before he got to the hospital, but he soared into the presence of the king and he entered the kingdom forever and you can you imagine when he arrived in heaven and they said he was serving communion and now he's with us this is a hope that christian has you can't take his life you can only send him to heaven right so you say well i'm worried well you won't be worried forever and you should be worried less and less. More and more, as Jesus is your king, your worries should be less and less until one day he's going to remove all your worries. He's going to defeat all your enemies. This is his promise. 
He will restore our satisfaction, our, fulfill our longings. He will restore our peace. He will restore our joy. And you'll be filled with supernatural, spontaneous joy, spontaneous sense of well-being. I uh, saw a young man come to faith in, in our last church, and uh, he got saved on our Algonquin trip. He was standing in our kitchen one day. And this isn't true for everybody. It was true for Brendan. Brendan said, you know what, Pastor, since I got saved, he said, before I was saved, I was so depressed. I was so sad all the time. I, I actually took medication for it. He said, you know what happened? After I got saved, I didn't have to take the medication anymore. And that's not true with everybody, but it was true with Brendan. He said, after I got saved, I just didn't need to take the medication anymore. This is a lady that I've been watching her life for a long time. Her name is Audrey. And I knew her husband. I knew two of her sons really well. And over the years, we would kind of, they would come into my life. I'd go into, go into their lives. And I watched this lady, and she's had one loss after another. Years ago, she was a student at a Bible college. She met a young man. They married. He became a pastor of a small church in West Michigan. Pastored there for a long time. They had a large family. But one at a time, her children began to die. They began to have different diseases and problems. And they had lots of heartache and lots of difficulty. I watched their life. I watched Audrey's life. I watched her husband Jerry's life. I, I, I had some occasion to spend time with a couple of their sons. And I was just thinking about her the other day because her profile popped up on Facebook. Facebook. You know what she said? She said, pray for my grandson because he has cancer. And I just thought, Lord, how much heartache are, is this lady going to have to endure in her life? And I stopped and I prayed for her. And I sent her a little bit of a note. But I noticed that Audrey had put an interesting little note on her Facebook page. Can I read it to you? She wrote, I accepted the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior at age 16. I married Jerry, and we were married for 58 years. I'm a mother of seven, two on earth, five in heaven. Can you imagine going to five of your children's funerals? I've been a pastor's wife for 27 years, a Sunday school teacher, piano teacher, after my retirement, I took care of my mother-in-law for seven years. After I took care of my mother-in-law for seven years, I took care of my mother for three years. And then my husband had dementia. Now he's in heaven too. And then she wrote, Heaven is my ultimate destination, and I long for the blessed hope of seeing my loved ones again for all eternity. I noticed the other day she posted a song on her Facebook a big choir in a big church and they were singing at the midnight cry we will all go and see the lord audrey understands this longing for the kingdom and one day god will reward her for all that she faithfully suffered and he will you too he will restore your joy someday she's going to have a big family reunion with her loved ones only believers have this hope he will restore satisfaction when we repent and lament, he'll restore our peace. He'll restore our abundance progressively and then ultimately in the kingdom. He'll restore our abundance. Look at verse 24. You say, well, I I'm lacking. Well, if you walk with the Lord, I think what you'll notice is that God will take care of you. Can I get a witness on that? Let's do that again. If you walk with the Lord, I think you will notice that the Lord will take care of you. Can I get a witness on that? You see, that I know that's true because I, I like to talk to, to seasoned saints. How's that sound? Seasoned saints. Men and women who've walked with the Lord for a long time. And they will not always live in palaces. And they won't always drive new cars. And they won't always have lots and lots of nice things. But they will almost always say, you cannot outgive the Lord. They will almost always say, God is faithful. God is good. God has been good to me. Often they'll be in the hospital suffering and they'll have heartaches and they'll just say over and over again, God has been so good to me. Now why is that? Because when you lament and when you repent and when you enter into the kingdom and when Jesus is your king, progressively more and more he supplies your needs and ultimately in the kingdom he will supply every need in an abundance that we cannot imagine and he will also restore the lost years in fact, it's only possible. Think about, he promises to restore lost years in verses 25 and 26. How can he restore 
lost years. Think about that. He will restore lost years. Go to the next one. In chapter 20, chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, he said, I'll restore the years the locust has eaten. This can only mean this. That God has the miraculous and amazing ability to compensate miraculously for whatever was taken away from us, even if it was in judgment and it was our fault. Judah sinned against God. God let their crops be eaten for probably about four years. But if God wants to, the fifth year, he can give more crops than they would have had in the first four years. Listen, we've experienced this in our own family. We've seen God do things that you, you, you'd have to work your whole lifetime to do, and yet God did them in a moment. And he can do that. Those who trust him, those who live in lamentation over sin and in repentance and eagerness to, to walk with the Lord. My grandfather had, an old, had a farm in, in central Ohio, and it wasn't really fancy at all. When he would go to fix it, he had, he, was a, he had lived through the Depression, and so he didn't just automatically go buy something new when he needed it. He would fabricate things, and he would improvise things. And I remember when I was working with him on the farm one summer, he said, we're going to need some screws or some nails or some hinges or something. And he says, you're gonna, if you go in the garage, you look in the back, there's a bucket in the back corner, you're going to find what you need. And if you couldn't find it in the various buckets that he had, he would literally go down. I remember one time I went down by the pond where there was an old barn that had fallen down years ago, and it was in disrepair. He, disrepair. he left it there, and the reason was because from time to time, if he needed a board or if he actually needed nails, we would go and we'd pull nails from old boards, we would straighten them in his shop, we would put them in a can, and we would use them again. A skilled person can take things that other people would have thrown away and build something useful and something valuable and something beautiful. And Jesus is the master craftsman of the soul this way. He can take the broken things that nobody else wants, the pieces of our life that really grieve us, that we're embarrassed about. He can take those very things and he can put them together into something that's going to shine throughout the ages in eternity because he's just that wonderful. Amen? That's what he's saying that he will do here, not just with Judah, but with you and with me. And so there's got to be a demo day first, though. The lament and the repent. And then the sixth thing is he'll restore our intimacy with himself. You notice that, by the way, the, 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 one of the big themes that runs throughout the Bible is this kingdom theme. But a sub-theme, a theme that goes along with it and, and, and connects with it is this intimacy, this walking with God intimacy theme. And you see it in like the you see it in the garden there was this original camelot this original garden paradise where a pre-incarnate jesus walked with adam and eve in the cool of the day and they had unbroken fellowship with god but then sin destroyed it and all throughout time god has been working to restore the kingdom and in the end when you read your bible one of the things it says is the king comes and the kingdom comes and then god is with his people but we also have a sense of that in the spiritual kingdom now because we have the indwelling spirit and we should long for a sense of intimacy with God. And the one thing that destroys that is any kind of tolerating sin in our lives. You tolerate sin in your life, your sense of intimacy with God is hindered. But when you repent, isn't this true? Your sense of intimacy with God and the presence of God returns. Students of revival and preachers that preach about revival will say this. When you define revival, they will say revival is nothing more and nothing less than an intense sense of the presence of the Lord. And that's what God says he will do, and that's what you want. And, and then he, he, just to remind you of this, look in chapter 2 and verse 19 toward the end. He says, I will no more make you a reproach. Look at verse 23. He was given the early rain for your vindication. Look at verse 26. Never again will you be put to shame. And then repeats it two verses later. Never again will you be put to shame. Here's what happens. When we make a mistake, or when we live among others sin against us, or we sin, then we're plunged into remorse, into shame. And Jesus says, when you come into the kingdom, I will vindicate, I will lift that shame, I will vindicate you. Years ago, there was a young lady named Joyce. And Joyce was a nurse, and she worked all night in the hospital. But one night she got off early. She's a Christian girl. She got off early one night and she went home to her house. And when she got to her house, she heard a noise in her bedroom. And when she opened the door, her husband was there committing adultery with another woman. And he left her 
but she had a little girl her, her and her little girl's name Cindy Dawn now she was a single mom with a little girl that she had to raise and she had to bear this great sorrow and frankly in the churches where she attended they weren't very understanding with her she went to uh, she had but she had a young man living next door and his wife living next door on Clancy Street in Grand Rapids Michigan and he was a student at seminary and she became friends with the woman and they said well come visit our church one day while she was there in church a uh, parishioner collapsed and they said is there a doctor in the house and there was a man named Jay who was there and as their nurse and there was Joyce and Joyce and Jay came and they began to help this person later on they discovered that Jay's wife had left him and Joyce's husband had left her and the young seminary student my mom my dad and my mom stood up with Joyce in their wedding and my dad told me he said a lot of my seminary friends said we shouldn't have supported her being remarried but she remarried but there was a shame on her life even though she hadn't sinned she hadn't done what was wrong there was this like question and she r raised her little girl a number of years later I was called to a pastorate and I went to the orientation session for the new pastors and it was being hosted by a pastor from here in Michigan who's really one of the most dynamic pastors in Michigan and his wife was named Cindy and Cindy came up to me and she said Kenny I remember you when we were little kids and I said oh Cindy I remember you too my sister Melanie was supposed to be taking a nap one day she's sitting in the stairs listening to my mother witnessed to a lady on the phone and my sister Melanie said to my mom when she got off the phone I need to be saved and my sister Melanie was saved not long after that she went out in the yard and she led little Cindy to the Lord the pastor's wife Cindy said to me your sister led me to the Lord today if we were to go to that church at the Shelby Road Baptist Church in Shelby in West Virginia you see one of the finest churches in the state pastored by a fine godly pastor whose wife is a radiant christian i think her mom has been vindicated don't you think this is what god can do god can take the years the locust has eaten and he can restore them and that's why jesus said when peter said what will i have if i follow you he said truly in the new world some some translations say in the regeneration when the son of man sits on his glorious throne you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel and everyone who has left houses of brothers and sisters of father and mother or children and lands for my namesake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life now peter hears this from jesus and after he's filled with the holy spirit he preaches on pentecost and what is his message repent he says be converted your sins will be blotted out times of refreshing will come from the presence of the lord until the time of restoration of all things which was spoken of by the prophets he said the whole storyline of the bible is a storyline of restoration it's a storyline of redemption it's a it's a, the unfolding drama of redemption and the place where the great sin of the world and justice and mercy meet in a place that place is called calvary i was in my study this morning Susan Beasley, come and join us up here. Susan's going to share a word of testimony with you. And Susan came in, and she shared a word of testimony. And I asked her if she would share the testimony with you because it so powerfully illustrates what we've been talking about. She'll have the last word, and then I will pray. Um, Christmas Day in 1995 my brother led our little sister, um, our 18-year-old sister, to the Lord. And 14 days later, the Lord took her home. That was January 7th. Um, fast forward. Um, a lot of, well, some of you know, I never had a good relationship with my mother my whole life, and I was in foster care and stuff, and... Um, it, it just wasn't a good situation. But um, she's here in Jackson now, and I'm helping to take care of her. She lives at the Friendly Home. And I was in there on Tuesday. I had to take her to an appointment. And when we got back from that, she, um, 
we were talking, and we were talking about my little sister, Hope, and, and she said, well, I'd like to see her again. I hope to see her again. I said, Mom, do you know where she's at? She goes, yep, she's in heaven. I said, well, if you were to die tonight, where would you go? And she said, probably to hell. Because of everything that I've done in my life. I said, well, you don't have to. And we talked about that some more. And um, <sighs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, after we talked some more, she, um, I said, Mom, I said the way. The way to do this, the only way to do it is through Jesus. And that's what Hope did. She accepted that gift. And I said, you can do the same thing. And I said, we all said, we just need to ask for forgiveness of our sins. I said, do you understand that? And she said, yes. She said, I am so sorry for what I put you through and what I didn't get you out of. And that I didn't get you out of foster care when you had to go there. And my mom has Alzheimer's. But she had some very lucid time, about 10 minutes worth of time with me, on Tuesday, January 7th, 24 years after my little sister died in a car accident. I longed for years for my mom to love me. Amen. And I got it on Tuesday. She accepted Christ as her Savior. <laughs> if you had been with us in our elders' prayer meetings, you would have known that, that um, Eddie would regularly bring Glennis's name up and here's a confession of mine he would tell me how hardened she was he would tell me how stubborn she was he would tell us just truthfully how really hateful she was about bringing up the name of the Lord and we prayed for her and we prayed that she'd have an issue slipping away in terms of being able to think clearly and we prayed and then be candid I wonder of the 14 elders how many of us really believed that God would do what he did on Tuesday See, when we re-lament and when we repent, then God begins to work in our lives, and we can trust that. Let's stand together. Let's pray as we're dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you for the promises of your word, the warnings, the threatenings, and the promises. Lord, help us now, your people, to watch over our own hearts for pockets of idolatry, of of seeking after empty things and worshiping the gift and not the giver. Even this week, I pray that the, the kingdom blessings, the kingdom restorations will begin to flow into our own lives as we seek you more and more until the day when the kingdom, king comes and the kingdom, the kingdom ret king returns and the kingdom comes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.